Why would the private sector invest in a developing country? There's always a tension, isn't there, between a company's imperative to maximise shareholder value and at the same time look after the welfare of its communities and its employees. And I think, you know, constant progress is being made. I mean, compared to the world in which I worked when I first worked, the world is a much better place for that now. There are real fears that a lot of this investment is very short term and highly speculative. Investors coming in seeking to make a quick buck, maybe acquiring land, felling the trees, uh, getting the maximum benefit that they can in the short term and then selling it on to somebody else. The private sector doesn't care about people's development. The private sector isn't supposed to care about people's development on its own terms. That's not even a criticism of them. They are there to make money, maximum money. When confronted with scenes of poverty, you could be forgiven for thinking that any sort of financial investment would be a good thing. But is it? And even if it is, how does it work? Who's doing it? And why? Some of the international financial institutions like the International Finance Corporation and the World Bank are very much about trying to promote private sector investment and to create the conditions in which more of that will happen. And yet they're increasingly recognizing some of the really damaging consequences that some of this investment is having. Central to the way global investment takes shape is a set of ideas advanced by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. The so-called dead hand of the state systematically sapped initiative and discouraged enterprise. Instead, unregulated market capitalism would deliver efficiency, growth and prosperity for everyone. Neoliberalism is an attitude that the private sector should play a greater role in the economy versus the state. That can manifest itself in a manner of ways that can involve removing all regulation, so that markets can operate as fully and freely as possible. It can involve free trade, no controls on capital between nations, and it can involve privatising what were once national industries. As Western economies and international institutions work ever harder to flood the developing world with private money, what does it all mean for the people on the ground? The nature of the investment has changed, the kind of people doing the investment has changed, and the degree of control or scrutiny that a country can have over that investment has changed. All of which is the product of neoliberalism. All of this is the product of a system of global governance that's all about taking control over money and flows from people and governments and giving it to massive corporations. I don't believe that institutions like the IMF, the European Investment Bank, or the, or the IFC are deliberately underwriting corruption or cynically saying, well, we want Western companies to profit at the expense of developing nations. I think the problem is that they are very much wedded to this ideology of what's best for financial corporations is what's best for everyone. Business needs money. With this in mind, a non-banking industry that could provide it would quickly become the darling of neoliberal governments around the world. But as with many aspects of the financial system, private equity can have a dark side. A private equity company buys 
other companies that aren't listed on stock exchanges. It can work sort of as a venture capitalist, putting money into a new fledgling company and helping it grow. But on the other hand, it can also come along to existing companies and look at them and say, I think this company is being run in an inefficient manner and I think we have the expertise and the know-how to, to make it more efficient. So what they'll then do is buy the company, restructure it, and then hopefully sell it on at a profit. The problem is that often they acquire these companies using tons and tons of debt, which then belongs to the acquired company. They'll generally restructure the management, they'll probably lay off a lot of employees in an efficiency bid, possibly sell assets and then sell the company on. There's been tons of cases where these companies have been saddled with debt and have, have gone bankrupt. Most people think of an investor company as trying to add value, right? They go in, they make an investment, they want to increase the productivity of the enterprise or they, they put in new machinery or they transfer skills or whatever, so they make the enterprise more valuable so they can take the profits home. This is not how private equity works. They're mainly looking at very high, what they call alpha returns, as quickly as possible. And so the way you attain those returns is the opposite of sustainable development. Sustainable development requires long-term investment, usually cross-sectoral investment, patience to grow enterprises, to train people, to add skills to, to a workforce. Equity is the exact opposite of that. It's taking the most valuable components of that enterprise and putting whatever remains back on the market again. In the developed world, the vast majority of land is privately owned. And if a corporation wants to buy some, it needs to negotiate directly with the landowner. But many people in the developing world, particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia, have little or no legal rights to the land on which they live and work. If a corporation wants to buy land here, it need only talk to the government, and not necessarily the local people, who may have lived and worked here for generations. There's been considerable disquiet about the amount of land that's being acquired by international investors over the last few years. Land is being allocated by government to a number of outside interests and a lot of local farmers are being displaced as a consequence. In some cases you've got people coming in seeking land um, where they are very much wanting to establish a productive enterprise. So let's look at, say, uh, an investor who wants to bring irrigation to an area to grow sugarcane, to set up a processing plant, to generate lots of jobs for local people. So that, that looks like a relatively good investment. In other cases, you've got people who are seeking to acquire rights over large areas of land. They may not actually have a plan for how they are going to use it over the next five, ten years, but they're, if you like, banking that land, speculating in that land, in the hopes that over five or ten years it becomes more valuable and then they can sell it, or, you know, over time they'll think of something that they can use it for. But, what then happens to the people who've been using that land? Where are they going to go? What kind of compensation will they get? I am optimistic about private investment in Africa because I think there is um, an enormous need for it and an enormous opportunity for it. There is well-meaning but misguided uh, interference from certain parts of the community towards private investors. And I think it's ideological and political. Up until we came along, you had a slightly absurd situation in which a country which is a, a wonderful country in which to grow trees was importing timber, certainly from South Africa and even from as far away as Uruguay and South America. Um, in the course of time, as our plantations begin to come online, that will no longer be the case. It has huge social and economic benefits. We've created two and a half thousand jobs already in Uganda and we, we, we will create many more. The normal sort of ratio for the creation of job and social benefit is that at least six people uh, directly benefit from the creation of a job, so that's 15,000 people 
directly benefiting. We've invested $25 million uh, in a project that, that has seen no profit yet uh, over nine years. I mean, that's, that's a, a difficult investment scenario for most people to contemplate. We've built 11 primary and, and secondary schools. Uh, we've created 2,200 outgrower programs, uh, yeah, above and beyond the 2,500 jobs that we've created. We've built orphanages, health clinics, cleaned up wells, uh, in, engaged in all sorts of other um, opportunities for people to generate wealth. Um, and yes, look, I'm not saying that there aren't a few people who may be worse off now than they were before, but the vast, vast majority are much better off now than they were then. And those who we haven't yet been able to get to, we will get to in the course of time. I think inevitably land generally as a global philosophical concept is obviously an increasingly big issue. The world's population is growing, the supply of land is not. So I suppose the use of land and particularly competition between land used for growing food and land used for almost any other purposes is, is an issue and is going to become increasingly an issue and it's a, it's a very legitimate issue. There has been a huge lack of transparency around many of these deals. They've been done behind closed doors. Very often, very little coming back to government in terms of tax revenue or, or other benefits that they might expect. Very often land is being allocated for 40, 50, sometimes 99 years. That's a very, very long time. So governments are tying up land uh, in a way which is going to make it a lot more difficult for them to respond to the needs of their own people in generations to come. Why do governments go along with this? Because a lot of them are in on the scam. A lot of them are either literally in on the scam, they're either taking a good chunk of change. But to me, the most insidious aspect of global capitalism is ideological. And they're in on the scam because they were educated at Oxford and they worked on a Wall Street firm and they believe the same stuff. It's not really for us here to tell the government of Mali, the government of Ethiopia, the government of Botswana, what they should accept or not accept in terms of investment. However, I think where we do have a role to play is making sure that groups within those countries are getting their own voices heard and that they can engage much more effectively with the government of those countries and to take part and demand much greater accountability and transparency in relation to how these national assets are being managed and transferred. There are a number of things that people can do if they care about this issue. They can think about what their money is funding. A lot of pension funds directly invest in things like land grabbing and private equity, and also actually a lot of university endowment funds. So for example, Harvard University has come under a lot of criticism for what they're investing in. People should put pressure on the government to argue for reform of our international institutions so that developing countries' interests are properly represented. I think in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, where we've seen quite clearly that the attitude that the markets know best and the markets should just be sort of left to do their job resulted in a catastrophic failure, I think people need to take a step back and think realistically about what markets can and can't deliver. Mm -hmm.